Hey guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Good. How are you all doing? Everyone been enjoying themselves so far? Yeah. Okay. Ah, there we go. There we go. That's nice. <laughs> Look at this. Cheering in the parliament. Good. It's glad to see you guys. I'm really glad to see you guys so fired up. I know we've had sort of two half days in the... Uh, in the workshops, I know they've been very, very engaging. I've put my head into a few of them and everybody's been, been really engaged. So that's wonderful. Uh, and that's exactly what, what the hope of this was all, was all for. So we're here, we've only got about an hour actually. We haven't got too much time. Um, and we are starting slightly later than we would have perhaps liked to. We're waiting for, for the chairman of the EPP group, Manfred Weber. He's going to arrive any moment. Uh, the purpose of this is to give you guys a little bit more time with him, a, few, a bit more of an open debate perhaps. I mean, we had a pretty open debate yesterday, right? But a little bit more sort of a, of a free-for-all um, to ask questions. We've also got Eva Medell and Lydia Pereira, people you know well now after our, after our, our day yesterday. Um, uh, but yeah, also what we're going to be doing is having the results of the, uh, of the top eight ideas that will go into our voting session tomorrow. Uh, that's going to happen at the, end of our, at the end of our session today. Um, Leo uh, is going to be returning at some point and, will, uh, and he will be bringing the result. They are literally counting them right now. Um, so just as a, as a bit of a sort of structural plan, we'll have, we'll have our debate in here and then we'll have those results. And then the top eight teams uh, who are chosen, you will stay in the room uh, and you're going to have a short pitching sort of session with Leo. I think you guys already know about this, but just to, just to reconfirm exactly what we'll, what we'll be doing then. Then tomorrow, it's really crucial. Uh, I know that it can be, as, as somebody that works in this town, I know how tiresome it can be coming in and out of the security gates here. And especially in the morning tomorrow, uh, I think it will be quite busy. So please advise you tomorrow morning to get, try and get into the parliament as early as you possibly can to get through the security because we've got a lot to, to do. Tomorrow you have possibly, I'm envious of this to be honest, you're going to be having live votes on the, on the machines in front of you where you're going to get to vote. That's a, that's a cool thing to be able to, be able to do here in, in the parliament. So um, get yourselves ready for that. As I say, we'll hear all the, the eight groups that are going to be going forward uh, tomorrow at the end. And I, I assume that the counting is still ongoing. Now, as I said, we're waiting for, the, we're waiting for Manfred Weber. But in the meantime, I think we'll just start our debate. We're going to have a little session with him. He's going to uh, answer some of my questions and then, and then we'll put them to you. But while we're waiting, let's, let's open the floor. Let's get going. Let's have a bit of a debate. Uh, so if anybody has questions, so, ah, important for me to rem remind you, the button, put your hand up. I'll take your number down uh, and I will try and get to as many people as possible. Also, I will try and get to people that I didn't get to yesterday. I, I promise I was doing my absolute best, but it was, you know, there was a lot going on, so it can be difficult. So is there anyone that would like to raise their hands? Anyone that has any questions quickly for, ah, here we go. Let's start. You, you guys are perfectly fine with this, right? Yeah, great. So, yeah, so stand up, number 68. Uh, I hope the tech team are cool with this. Um, and state your name, uh, where you're from, and, and put, your, put your questions to the room. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Manuel Stroh. I'm from Germany. Uh, two years uh, ago, the European Union um, passed very hard times during the Brexit. And a lot of my um, friends were... Uh, very worried about the future of the European Union, so I want to ask you how you imagine the future of the European Union, European Union in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm just going to introduce another of our MEPs who's arrived, Michaela Shoydrova. Thank you so much for being with us. A Czech member of uh, the European People's Party. Yeah, yeah. A new person. It's it's a, it's a really, really interesting and valid point, um, Brexit, and what it means for the whole of the EU. Do you know what, uh, Makeda, why don't, we, why don't we start with you, introduce yourself, and I suppose you can we pick up on that and, and, and say what you, what you feel about that, uh, the, the issue of what losing a member has, has done to the, to the European Union. Yeah, 
Thank you very much. Um, just shortly uh, to introduce me, I am from Czech Republic. Um, it's my second mandate. I am a member of CUT Committee, so I, I am vice chair of CUT Committee, Culture and Education, an important issue for UN Agri Committee. But uh, maybe my colleague would like to answer your question for Brexit. For me, it was big disappointment. I was very disappointed for this Brexit. We, we, we missed our dear British colleagues. I think it's, uh, yeah, we lost, European Union lost, and we should draw uh, the lesson from this. And we should continue in cooperation, because fortunately, uh, United Kingdom stays in Europe. So we should cooperate, we should continue on the level of universities, of young people and other programs. So we try to, restart cooperation also in Erasmus, because for us it was a big loss. So we hope that the future, uh, they will, uh, it's my opinion is that we should cooperate and we should find the way how to, uh, um, how to uh, come back for uh, United Kingdom, I hope. Yeah. the common future. L long way off, especially with the, <laughs> yeah. with the new Prime Minister that's just been appointed there. I wonder, that f from a sort of future point of view, uh, Lydia, perhaps, I mean, the structure of the European Union, I mean, it doesn't look like there's, there's much scope for, for Britain rejoining, but, but how, does, how does the Union stay strong in that sort of loss of a member? Well, um, if you, just out of curiosity, it was actually in this chamber that we uh, saw the, the final uh, vote on um, on Brexit, and uh, we were sitting, uh, I was sitting over there, somewhere in 500 something, and I was very close to the to our colleagues from um, from the United Kingdom, from uh, Nicola, um, Nigel Farage and all the others, and they were celebrating with champagne and making a lot of fuss, um, and this side of the chamber was clearly um, celebrating, and while these, the middle side of the chamber was kind of uh, uh, in tears and, and crying. And uh, I remember in those days I did a podcast. I have a one. Uh, I usually have my <clears throat> podcast with different guests, and I had did it with a, a former uh, colleague of ours, uh, Nina Jill, with whom I still um, I'm in touch. But uh, it was a very touching moment. But it's also a wake up call. Um, and a wake-up call and uh, a lesson learned. I think, um, uh, well, democracy prevailed in, in the UK. Um, people chose to leave the EU. But what I think we should focus on is on our cooperation and how we still have many, many, many things that bring us together rather than tear us apart. And that's in that spirit that I think we have to face the UK knowing that, okay, in the short term, for sure they will not come back, but what if we as youngsters work our relationship with our colleagues uh, in the UK and uh, through programs like Erasmus, we can sometime, uh, like 15 years or in 10 years or even shorter, we can welcome them back to our union. So I think we should look into that as a, a moment in history, probably um, one of the most uh, symbolic moments uh, in this uh, decade. But, uh, you know, the lesson here is that we have to keep working on our cooperation and working on understanding each other, knowing each other much better. And that's what we are also doing here this week. It's, it's been really interesting, especially in the Parliament since, since Brexit, I think. Uh, as journalists, uh, I think, that we, uh, especially uh, in the press pack, but also there was always a tendency to, to hear a lot from the Brits because of the, the English, the good language, like the good power of the language. And now there's been a real restructuring, though, I think, of, of how that works and a lot more representation from other nations as well. So in some, you know, it's sort of one small silver lining. Uh, okay. There are people here, that we, I saw number 203, I think, no, yes, you, 230, you had your hand up all day yesterday. Come on, give us a question. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name's Dean from uh, Mayo in Ireland. Uh, my question is about the cost of living crisis. We're living in a cost of living crisis. Uh, as we go into the winter, people are going to struggle to heat their homes. 
to do with rising energy costs. We're, we're trying to empower youth, and it's all very well and good talking about Erasmus and about interrailing, but the real way we can empower youth is by enabling them to build their careers, to build families, and to be successful. So really, I want to ask, what is Europe doing in the short term to uh, alleviate the cost of living crisis for young working people who are trying to, uh, to build their careers? Thank you. Should, should we come to you, Ava? Is, it's interesting for you, because your country is just about to enter an election, which is heavily on this issue as well, really dominated by it. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot to number 230 Dean, if I got your name uh, correctly. Perfect. Um, thanks for posing this, this question. You know, a couple of months ago, I spoke with my team and I said, listen, we, we need to think of, uh, on this topic. And, you know, for the centre-right is not the natural topic to address. Um, but um, what I've noticed um, is that over the past couple of weeks, um, we kind of refer to the cost of living without referring to, um, you know, the real causes that have caused uh, that have caused the rising prices. And there is a number of factors, but the most serious of factors of all is the war in Ukraine. And I think, um, you know, it's there, but we don't seem to talk in our societies enough about what Ukrainians are going through right now and how they will be surviving uh, the next couple of months um, uh, in, in Ukraine. And the reason why I say that is because we do live right now life as we know it to a certain extent. We are all worried for the next couple of months. Uh, but at the same time, I think we don't think enough for those that are defending the European values and European principles right now uh, in a war zone, basically. Um, and I think there are some countries that are much closer to the Ukrainian borders um, who, um, you know, even there the debate has shifted. Um, I just think that the next, not just couple of months, but probably a longer period will be very tough for Europe cost of living, the development in Ukraine, they might continue to deteriorate. Um, and I think we need to sober up. And I think this needs to be our, uh, so to say, awakening moment for Europe. Uh, perhaps it didn't happen with Brexit necessarily, it didn't necessarily happen with COVID, but now it's high time that we, you know, uh, live outside of our uh, bubble and are able to deliver on those policies that would really empower the youth to build their careers, that would really empower businesses survive over the next couple of months and households uh, as well to be able um, to, um, you know, uh, meet the month end, uh, so to say. Uh, so with the EPP and our chairman uh, who has just uh, joined us, uh, we are developing a very clear strategy, which is of course, you would need to support, but you would need to enable those that could help the economy uh, continue operating. So it's, a very, it's going to be very tough for all of us, and I think we need to brace up. Um, and this is, was part of my um, you know, speech yesterday. Uh, I think uh, you are coming of age much earlier uh, with all that's going on in the world, and your wise advices that you've been discussing, I think, can guide us in the next couple of months as well. So I look forward to hearing them. Thank, thank you so much. Have we had any answer from each of our MEPs there? Well, that sort of timed nicely uh, while, while we wait a few, Chairman. I know, I know you're extremely busy. Before we just move on, though, just to let you know, I've got number, I'll tell you the numbers that I've got down and we will make sure that we get these questions in. 12, 307, 305, 17, uh, 147, 296, 297, and 358. They're the numbers that I've got down. I can see you. <laughs> I'll try and get some more in as well, but, but that's, that's the ones I had down, and we'll, we'll try and move. Manfred Weber, thank you so much for joining us. I know you've got an extremely busy day. Uh, and the point of this is to have a, have a bit of a conversation with you, because I know you were, you were tied up yesterday. Do, do, would you like to come down onto the side down here? Or Perfect. From the, from the audience? OK, wonderful. OK, great. Well, let's head to number 12 then, please. Hello, um, 
Oh, sorry. Uh, hello, my name is Julia. I'm from Poland and I would like to ask you, is it actually possible um, for young people to speak and being actually listened to um, if still many of them don't have any rights to speak in their families or countries um, freely? I believe it is possible, but how can we do it? Thank you. Let's, let's turn to you. To you, Chairman. Well, Julia, I, I just was considering what do you mean with freely speaking? Do you feel that there is in Poland not the chance to really speak and, and freely express your opinion? You know, we have some rule of law doubts when it is about Poland, but I hope it is not so far reaching that you cannot stand up and uh, 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 position yourself. Huh? Can, you, can you follow a little bit up on this? I mean, I'm not thinking about Poland yeah. uh, as the country, but just like in general, there uh, it's still quite um, hard for people to speak uh, freely just in their families, let's say. So how can we do something about this? Um, yeah, just for people to have right to speak, even though they have rights, but they might be afraid to talk. Well, I would say, I would say, when it is about being afraid of 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 of, of, of position yourself, of, of speaking out loud, um, well, there is there is one one concern when there is really such a regime or such an atmosphere in a in a in a in a family or with your friends, where you feel uh, aggressively attacked if you say the wrong thing. Then it is very difficult because that is against the fundamental idea of of freedom, of democracy, of our of our way of life. But on the other hand, I have to say on the issues when you disagree, it's all about courage. It's all about uh, it's all about standing up and really fighting for for the interests. Uh, you know, we have this uh, Fridays for Future. When I see it on the European global level, where young people. Um, showed up and told us politicians take about uh, take care about uh, global uh, level about uh, climate change. Um, I would probably add to this kind of uh, being loud and being uh, being offensive with young ideas. I would add that I would would love to see also next to the uh, clear messaging of the demonstration also very concrete proposals because it's uh, in politics not only a one-sided in a way wishing list where you can only say climate change climate change climate change we as epp we know you know also that it's also about social it's also about jobs it's also everything must work together and that would be let me say mark my, my my additional uh, request uh, to the young gener generation as a whole to be not one-sided huh? to be to be then also balanced and then it's more convincing if you present the package huh? then it's much more convincing than only with one, one aspect. I don't know whether I got your point right, but I hope I could give an uh, additional point. Uh. Thank you so much. So, so let's move on to number 307 was next on my list. Uh, I don't know where that is. Nope. That, that's next on my list afterwards. So yeah, 305. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Hello, EPP people. My name is Adrian, I'm from Romania, and uh, I have uh, one same simple question. Uh, when will Romania enter to the Schengen area? <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me and us on this podium today, uh, that is our message. Uh, so from a from a legal point of view everything is clarified so romania did a great job in preparing themselves with a lot of european assistance i have to say you know money and so on to protect borders new technologies were in were invented so real great effort and also internally about fight against corruption all these things so great preparation and when we speak about schengen it's not only about the border control please don't forget schengen is a has a lot on a second part because Schengen, without, so a room without borders, only works if we have also a very trustful cooperation with the security agency, so our police organization. And that is also working because there is a growing trust between the Italian, the German, the Polish police together with the Romanian. There is a growing trust, and you build up trust. Huh? And that's why both elements, border control and 
cooperation of security uh, 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 agencies is working very well. So tomorrow and today, let's start. Uh, the blocking situation is on council side. You know, Germany now gave also green light. Uh, we are aware about this. And hopefully also Netherlands, also other blocking, let me say, countries for the moment will de-block it. Um, and uh, then also to clarify this, uh, the next step is hopefully a new government. We also want to welcome Bulgaria in the team, that both of them can really join Schengen. So it's a great success story. Schengen and Romania, Bulgaria should be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll go to 291 um, in the white chair up there, yeah. Hello, I'm Margarida from Portugal and thank you for taking the time for have this discussion with us. I have a question uh, that um, I got to it because young people, especially young people outside this room, normal young people who don't really have a, an enormous interest for European politics, they sometimes need a more simple language to better grasp and just understand. So many times we can relate uh, political parties with some strong associations. We can think justice, we can think um, environment, etc. And I feel that sometimes there's a tendency for the EPP uh, group and EPP party to make the distinctions what we are not. We are not exactly that, we are not exactly the Greens, we are not exactly uh, the left, we are not exactly this. And I was wondering if you would have to choose one strong word for young people to grasp the essence of EPP, what word would you choose? Thank you very much. Re really great question as well. It's like the crux of European politics. I think we can take that word from, from each of our panelists. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the question came to you. <laughs> Well, it's, well, it's difficult well, in one word. I well, think first, three, first, maybe. Will, will you accept three? Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, first, first I, would, I would joke, I would say, it's so difficult for a politician to have only one word, you see. That's, <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. Um, one word. I would say, in a way, center. If you force me one word, it's very difficult, extremely difficult. But I would say center. And if I would have allowed to add, then I would say uh, in, in today's world, it's extremely important to keep society together. We are splitting up a lot. And that's why for me, being in the center, trying to manage things, to bring things together is probably boring sometimes. And I fully get your point that this is not so easily to understand, especially for those who don't care so much about what we are doing here. But on the other hand, it's the essence of everything. It's the essence of everything. If we are not ready to finally bring things together, then there is no chance. So again, much, than one, much more than one word, but that is, that is what comes to my mind when you... But there is so much more. We are the party of Europe. We are the party of basic values. We are today the rule of law party in Europe. Donald Tusk in Poland, it's in Romania, it's Klaus Johannes, it's, we, are the, we are the party of rule of law all over Europe today. So there is so much to say, but I would say center and keeping society together is today probably the most important task for us. For, for the, I, we're going to move on to them. I think every single European politician would struggle with this question as well. I think that it's really interesting. We'll move on to Ava and Lydia and also to Michaela. I got inspiration uh, by my pamphlet. My one word was different, uh, but you've mentioned the word together more than the word center. <laughs> so I think uh, my word would be uh, together uh, because uh, we are, as Manfred says, the bridge builders. We bring together. Together is solidarity. Together is u unity. And together is uh, Europe. So I would go for it together. <laughs> I, I think the word, um, eventually it's going to be an addition to, the, to what was said, to what Manfred said as uh, what, what defines EPP, but, um, and I think it is uh, prudency. We are prudent. We don't, want to, we don't want a revolution. We want reforms. We want to keep uh, the society together. We want to build across communities. 
but we don't want to go into the radical and just follow the trends of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, the emotions. So we are the, we are the ones that provide uh, policies, deliver policies in a prudent manner, covering the center, being moderate and together. I would connect it as, as, as such. Final word, Michaela. Okay. Thank you very much. Briefly, human dignity. If we follow this principle, we cannot make mistake. Human dignity is our program. Thank you. Re really interesting question, I've got to say, and, and interesting answers. Yeah. Like, like I say, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's interesting what you're doing is trying to consolidate the idea and the, the, the thing with, especially this parliament, obviously, is the, the political parties, the national parties that all come in and contribute. But it's a good, good question. OK, we're going to move to number 17 now. You had your hand up quite a lot yesterday as well, I think. Sir, please carry on. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Hungerland from Germany. OK, first off, I'm aware that this might be a difficult question. Um, but I need to ask it anyway, because I, as probably many others in this room, feel that I'm a European citizen represented by the European Parliament, because that's the people that I elected. And I therefore would love to see some power shifting from the European Commission towards the Parliament. And my question is, what is your take on that? And where do you see us? Is Europe ready for it? And if it's not, what do we need to do in order to provide a culture with one European Parliament holding the power? Thank you. Thank you. Though, first of all, let me start with an advertisement blog about the current European Parliament, because I want to share with you that there is, there is only a few, but the overwhelming majority of legislative things, regulation, directives and so on and so forth, must be approved by the European Parliament. That's the day situation with the Lisbon Treaty that made us so strong with the Lisbon Treaty. So a few issues, for example, on the uh, in some home affairs field on migration were in the past only intergovernmental and they arrive now in the European Parliament. So we are the power holder. Budget-wise, there is no single cent spent on European level without the approval of the European Parliament. And if I may say, because I'm also from Germany, uh, uh, John or Hans, uh, uh, so if I, uh, there is no, there isn't, compared with, with the German Bundestag, I tell you, that uh, in the German Bundestag we have a situation that we are quite, and I don't know how it is in the other member states, but this is quite centralized on the party level. Huh? We have coalition talks. Huh? The main decisions in Germany and Berlin are not made in the German Bundestag. Don't they say this outside and don't, 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 don't tell it to journalists. But it's not mainly made in the German Bundestag. It's made among party leaders when they have their coalition talks. That's the reality. So it's a party democracy and not so much a parliamentarian democracy. In the European Parliament, I have the honor to chair the EPP group. I have the honor to be the EPP president. But when I'm sitting there on my place and I'm making this uh, and then hope that 182 <laughs> colleagues behind me will vote in favor because I do this signal and uh, then I turn around and I hope that everybody will follow me, I cannot be 100% sure, you see. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, 96, 97% of the votes, we are fully united. But we have not this system of in a way, blind following party line. We have independent MEPs here, proud MEPs here, who have a mandate from their region, from their party, and they try to do their best to deliver at home, to be re-elected, to get again a mandate. That is really, I hope you feel, I, I, lo I love the European Parliament. It's, it's a real parliament where initiative counts, where good argument counts, and not, first of all, my party leader is number one and so on and so forth. So that's why this is the advertisement block now. <laughs> and, and, and the second thing is about uh, the democracy of tomorrow. Um, you know, the key question for making it for people understandable, that their vote count is that we didn't manage for the moment until now that a majority in the parliament arrives finally on the commission president. You know about the, uh, the situation in 2019, when I was the candidate of EPP. We had a congress of our party. We had a campaign between two candidates. I got the majority. 
But finally, here in the parliament, socialists and liberals didn't accept it anymore, the principles. We won the elections, and that's why we failed. Huh? That was the reality. And uh, I would invite you to consider probably having the current uh, wind of change in Europe in mind, to consider even bigger steps. Uh, I want to present you now an idea where probably some of you would say it's crazy, but is it an idea that for the future we consider to elect as European citizens a president of the European Union? A direct election of the president of the European Union that would be a democratic revolution. People all over Europe would immediately understand that my vote decides about the president of the European Union, probably in combination commission president and council president together, one person legally possible. And this person would then have the democratic legitimacy to be recognized with Joe Biden and President Xi on one level. Otherwise, we can never be accepted on the same level and we have to be the second class global power in a way. So, I don't know. Uh, thank you for the applause, but I don't know. We have to consider now, big next step. And that was the question about whether EPP is attractive enough or whether we are boring compromise, compromise uh, 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 dealer, uh, is probably also combined with such kind of ideas. Are we ready again to do big steps now in front of us and propose things which are easily understandable and gives a clear indication that EPP is the party in favor of a democratic Europe. That is what we fight for and we will succeed on this. Mm -hmm. Super interesting answer. Uh, <laughs> this is a very interesting proposal as far as Brussels, uh, the, the, the chairman's coming, coming forward with. Okay, let's go to um, 354. 354, I can't... Yeah, please. Hi, Rachel from Ireland. Um, I just wanted to raise, and something uh, one of the other Irish uh, raised was about the impact on the, energy, or on the cost of living on young people. Uh, kind of off that point is uh, the idea of unpaid internships for young people. We spend three, four years in college and then may progress further. And from there, uh, what happens is a lot of people don't have experiences and they end up in quite low paid jobs. Unfortunately, the issue with unpaid internships is it just completely reimburses privilege the entire time, which allows people who come from um, of a more privileged background to pick up these jobs and then develop themselves higher into a route uh, in maybe you might give your opinion on unpaid internships and what the EU might consider to do to regulate them and hopefully prevent them in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Ava who's had to go as well. Um, perhaps we can turn to you on this Lydia, I mean as, as the representative of the EU. Thank you so much for the question and actually we uh, in the EPP we, we launched an initiative to ban the unpaid internships that still exist in the EU Council uh, or in the European Council. Uh, the problem that we uh, still have is that there has to be a distinction between what is an, in, what is an internship and what is an employment. What we don't want to, to, to be uh, dragged to is that we have young people going between uh, internship after internship and they don't have like uh, a quality job that can assure them their emancipation and their, you know, their future steps in life. So, of course, um, uh, there are certain degrees of, of internships to which we also have to reflect upon. For example, there are um, internships in the curricula of universities, of cor courses, of bachelor's, uh, master's degrees, and so on. And for that, we also have to be a bit sensitive. What I think is that this is uh, still a competence from the national governments uh, to which uh, it, it also reflects the culture of uh, the job market of each one of those um, uh, member states. But the principle should be that there is some sort of remuneration, knowing that an internship is not um, uh, uh, is, is not an, um, a job, it's not a, an a permanent employment. So um, our view is that, or at least my view on that, is that in principle should not happen or there should be some compensation why, while the intern uh, is providing or is, is also learning. So there's also this uh, other side of, of, of the internships, um, but there has to be you know, certain policies according to the job markets and according to the cultures of the country countries that address the, the problem. Um, what I really don't want to see is uh, young, young, these younger generations, and it happened a lot 
or happens in, at least in Portugal, that uh, you jump from one internship to the other knowing that they, there's no certainty to what's coming after. So um, uh, it's important to get experience, to be equipped, to go into the job market, um, but there has to be some sort of compensation, in my view, to allow uh, the execution of the internships. That's what I think. Yeah. Michaela, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just I would like to uh, shortly join some words because, of course, EPP, every time we support decent work, decent conditions. Um, for uh, internship, traineeship is not only work uh, and uh, paid or unpaid. They are conditions like traveling, accommodation, and quality of traineeship. So we should account uh, like complex uh, this this uh, this question, but generally decent condition, decent work, and of course, if it's possible, paid. Uh, of course, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to 147. So we'll, we'll keep every... I th but f f I've got a long list of numbers now, just so you know, and we'll try and get to as many of these as we can. Um, we are also still waiting for Leo. Um, sorry? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, let's ask, let's ask a few then. So 147, 101, and 296 uh, are the next three. Thank you so very much. Go one uh, after each other. Yeah. jean louis Hen from uh, Belgium and from Brussels, uh, 30 years old. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a question because one of the topics, it wasn't my working group, but it's uh, uh, for me important, of course, is the democracy and the internal democracy within Europe. Uh, we had a fantastic uh, conference on the future of Europe, uh, which was attractive, which, wa which had... Uh, uh, which was an opportunity, of course, for the citizens and particularly the, the youth to uh, give some recommendations to the institutions. Uh, sadly, we had the COVID, of course, that uh, couldn't help the, um, the, the dynamic. And so, so the participation was uh, weak, of, of course. And uh, if we checked a bit, it was mostly uh, experts and people that were aware of the union that uh, participated. Uh, but well, of course, if we check, there are interesting uh, recommendations as well. So my question was to know, uh, four months later, how did the institutions and the member states uh, include the recommendations in their uh, functioning? And uh, what are your thoughts about the conclusions of the uh, conference? Do you think that it's, it was a gr great process, that it can be improved, that we should do others in the future? So it was just uh, to have a bit of thought on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's take um, 101, was it? Yeah, 101 and 296 had their hands up. Yeah? Oh, sorry, 102. Maybe. Yeah, 102. Sorry. Hello, my name is David. Um, and maybe it's a very specific question, but as we see electric prices rising, um, what is your view of point on the merit order system? And shouldn't we get rid of it because it's pushing prices up and it puts the EU at a great disadvantage in comparison to other countries outside of the EU? Very topical today. We just had an announcement from... Commission President von der Leyen. Uh, 296 as well, please. Hi, my name is Emily. I come from Denmark. I'm a member of town council in my hometown and I work a lot with the, the young community in my, my hometown. And here, one of the things I experience a lot is that they are afraid to share their ideas. They have so many great ideas, so many interesting thoughts, and they're scared to share them, not because they fear their right to, to speak, but because they're afraid that they don't know enough uh, about the topic and they're afraid that, that they don't have enough knowledge about it. And that's something that we also saw when we voted uh, for our uh, defense, uh, what's it called? Opt-out. Opt-out. Opt-out, uh, where one third of the population, mostly the young uh, generation, did not vote because they did not feel that they knew enough about the topic. And I was just wondering uh, how you view this issue about we have like a lot of people that are scared to, to share their opinions because they just don't think they know enough about it. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, let's start there. So we've got, we've got that question. Maybe if you want to start there and then success of the future of the conference, conference on the future of Europe and delinking energy prices as well. Uh, Alfred. I thank you so much. And it's great, great to get an idea that you really, because the first question I, I, I could listen to was also linked to this readiness to stand up and to speak and to express. So it's really an interesting feedback from your side, you know, to be scared 
with the argument, probably I don't know enough. My first message would be, wow, that sounds extremely serious because this means I first want to be aware about all the details before I uh, express myself. But on the other hand, I, I, I tell you a secret. Uh, the uh, older part of the generation of, of our society probably sometimes uh, has also not all facts in mind and they speak a lot about these. So <laughs> that's why I would say, please, please don't see this as a binding, as a, as a problem. Uh, really try to overcome this. Uh, on the other hand, everybody must do his best to be uh, aware about all arguments before you position yourself. So, well, on the European development, on the European discussions, referenda, you mentioned this, there, the biggest problem is that Europe is complex and I cannot change this. We speak about the whole continent. We speak about millions of people. We speak about 27 member states, history, culture, whatever. So there is a, it is extremely complex to find a common understanding and to find solution. But that's why it's so hard on European level to give easy, easy going answers, easy understandable answers. And we have to do our best. We always have to check ourselves whether politicians, administrations, governments are presenting things in an understandable way. But uh, on the other hand, not everything is possible to be so uh, easily communicated that immediately understand it. That's why there is a need to explain. There is a need to learn, to train, to experience and to listen to each other and then to find, uh, to make a judgment. Um, for the uh, for the electric uh, uh, merit order, I don't know whether we have experts here sitting. I only can tell you that, uh, David. I only can tell you that for Paris, David, uh, that we that we have this now on the table, and I understand that the electricity market is a special market because you need someone who is when you have a lot of consumption is really filling the gap on the top uh, and that is the expensive part of the electricity production so that's why it's a special market uh, we have to find a good understanding but currently it's not driven by market uh, uh, dynamics it's driven by speculation it's driven by speculation that's why we have to find a new regime and that is what we are currently working on and the last point about conference, I would say that uh, this was a great experience. I chaired the conference uh, working group on democracy. The outcome was really a good summary about ideas for what can we do for uh, continuing strengthening the European Union. I must, uh, I, I would say that on the concrete issues, climate change, uh, healthy environment, there I am sure that the outcome of the conference has a good impact about uh, uh, the legislation, is, is visible, is seen, is understood, so that has an impact. When we talk about the, uh, the more structural, the more uh, 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 treaty-based questions, then I must tell you from a party political point of view, I am totally disappointed about what Emmanuel Macron did with the outcome of the conference. You know, it was mainly initiated by Emmanuel Macron. It was one of his ideas. And the idea was to conclude with the conference during the French presidency. And this parliament supported him and said, after the conference, we need now a treaty revision. We need now the readiness to ask ourselves whether we are well prepared for the next decade. And we initiated a legally binding uh, offer to the Council to change the le a treaty and to make a convention. That is the method behind. And then we saw that Emmanuel Macron, after being re-elected as president in France, with a mandate now, he goes to the Council, he was leading the Council as Council president, uh, then he is initiating the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, revision of the treaty. And in July nothing happens, nothing happened. And that's why, let me be very outspoken, I, I, again, Macron is a pro-European president, I, I really like this very much, but on these points, I must say he is more interested in the visibility of a big show, of Strasbourg, and not so much interested in really hard work to deliver afterwards. And, and that's again our job as EPP to continue to work on this and to be con convincing with a fundamental change of Europe. Would you, would you like to contribute anything, Michaela? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I can confirm uh, what uh, Manfred Weber said about the outcomes of conference uh, on the future of Europe. Uh, for me, it was also a great experience. I was a member of the group for education, uh, culture, and I, I should uh, say that the, the proposal, we have uh, 49 
proposals, uh, very concrete, uh, and I think that uh, one of the most uh, uh, important is to improve and um, uh, um, yes, to improve knowledge about the EU, and the the people ask uh, for the common framework for citizenship education, for example, like the measure, like a tool uh, for the fight against uh, disinformations, against manipulation. It's one of the I think of the most important issue now, because really we face the disinformation campaign. If the people, they don't have information, they, they don't have knowledge about the EU, it's very easy. So um, I appreciate, I hope we will continue. We are speaking about convent, uh, which will discuss the proposals. We, we cannot uh, miss this uh, opportunity and those uh, expectations, so thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, like I say, I'm trying to come to as many as possible. Let's start with 358. Um, I've got a long list, so I think probably hands, hands that, are, that are on the list now are probably not going to get on there. So let's go with 358, 302, and 188. If you still want to ask a question. <laughs> Please, sir. Yeah, dear Mr. Chairman, my name is Philip. I'm from Pforzheim, Germany, and I have a question I believe that is concerning all of us, all our friends from all across Europe. Since the uh, European election 2009, we are, as an EPP family, constantly losing votes, losing seats, losing influence. And my question is, what are your takes and what are your ideas about how we as an EPP family can get back these votes, can rise from this state we're in, and uh, especially as a German um, CDU-Mitglied, um, um, we are not just losing the, the uh, European election, but in my state, in Baden-Württemberg, it's also the um, uh, regional elections, so they're always linked, and we're always losing regional votes also, so because uh, people connect Europe and the regional vote, because for them, EPP, CDU, it's the same. Thank you. Okay, so we said uh, 302, which I think is, yeah, just, just in front of you, but. Hello, my name is Robert from Romania, and my question for you is, 2022 being youth year, what do you see as biggest uh, accomplishments from this perspective. Thank you very much. And what did I say, 188, was it? Yeah, yeah. hello, Sorry, it's Maciej from Poland, and it's really great to be here with all the young people, and I'm really happy that EPP organized EPP Youth Week. But can we be sure that we'll have influence on the party after the event in terms of creating electoral lists, how to bring together already experienced politicians and young leaders, how to find that balance that we neither uh, paralyze the work of EPP group uh, nor make your parliament just a safe place for political retirement? Thank you. Those questions work nicely together, I think. Please. <laughs> Well, for the question of uh, not accepting that this is a place for a nice retirement, uh, um, I, uh, we need you. Huh? You have to take this into question, if this is the case. Uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that is, that is, democracy means competition. And, uh, and we have in all our countries, in the member parties as well, in the EPP family, different systems, different way of how, uh, let me say, the internal competition looks like. The, the, the easiest way is you have to nominate a candidate and you compete with them. Huh? Then people decide, the delegates of the party decide finally. Uh, and I only can really motivate you with the good arguments, with a good program to compete, to stand up and to present yourself as a candidate and to, to challenge everyone. That is what we need, this uh, fresh blood, these new ideas, this competition. And, uh, and that is also linked to the, to the question of, of Philip about uh, the, the idea how can we build up the ramp for 2024 for our next European elections. Uh, Philip, I have, to be, I have to be very honest, 
that on European level, we count a lot on the success of our national member parties. That's, that's obvious. Huh? If we are losing, when we are losing in Germany, uh, then, uh, then we, we, the Germany has the biggest part of the um, parliamentarians in the European Parliament, the biggest uh, 97 members are from Germany. And if we are losing there, we are losing here, and that means uh, uh, less influence. And, and that was the case over the last year. So it's a combined effort. Huh? It's a combined effort. We have to do a lot on the, on the campaigning there. We can learn a lot from each other. Uh, smaller parties can probably more profit from what we do now in the EPP headquarter on campaigning, data-based uh, social media work, for example, these kind of things, to get out with our messages. Uh, but the essence of being successful, the essence is in politics a convincing message and a convinc convincing political idea. And that's why probably I, 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 I repeat myself, but what we are currently really lacking, uh, when I'm coming back to our main duty, that is uh, the development on European level, that we have not yet identified in the EPP party, and that is what I want to do after Rotterdam, after our party congress, we have not yet identified a really convincing message for the EPP that we are the party of Europe, we are the party of the future of Europe, we, we are the party of building up Europe, uh, of the today's Europe. I said this yesterday uh, in my short welcome speech in the evening. So with Adenauer, with uh, a lot of strong leaders, Schumann, De Gasperi and so on, we founded Europe. The today's European Union is our Europe. The single market was against the Greens. They went to court against the single market. We did it in a lot of these things. It's our Europe. Eh? But if I would ask you today, what is the main aspect now for tomorrow's Europe, can we agree on the next step in front of us? Then I have my answer, but I doubt whether we have in all parties uh, the answer. And my answer is Europe of, um, of uh, defense and of external affairs. We have to build up a European voice in the world. That's the challenge of this decade. Uh, and everybody understands this with the war on European soil. But uh, when I speak with our leaders on national level, with Andrei uh, Blenkovic in Croatia, with, uh, with uh, Christianis, uh, with Mitsotakis, with all the friends there, then national responsibilities and, yeah, let's consider and let's see and so on and so forth, but not a really decisive, clear, uh, strong message behind. And that is what we need now uh, on a few of the key elements for the future of the European Union to define this. And I'm sure if we would do so, if we will do so, I'm sure those who are dominating the debate because they have a promising, a strong message for the future, they also can fight even against populism because populism is only strong in Europe because we have a lack of good ideas in the center currently. That is what, what, is, what is also strategically important. So uh, I have to apologize. It's really an extremely busy day today. Uh, that's why I myself, I, I must leave. Again, I really, I really thank you so much also for, for the impression I got from the talks. Please continue. Have also today a great, a great evening in Brussels and then we see each other tomorrow. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll take a few more questions. Uh, Michaela, Lydia, can you just because we have at, at what time? Five more minutes? Yeah, five more. Yeah. Okay, let's take three more then, if you if if you want. We've got. We'll take a group of three, and then we're going to move on, and we'll do the results of everything. So I'm I'm really genuinely sorry that we haven't been able to get to all the questions. I've tried to be as fair and sort of gender based and directions across the room and stuff. Uh, so the three that I'm going to go for are five, six, two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd be, I'm g glad about that because you've been very active back there and you're right at the back. Uh, 101 and 144. Um, yeah, we'll, is there, one, one, four, four, I think it was this. No, not you. Ah, maybe, maybe. Uh, okay, if it, let's let's take one that definitely had the hand. <laughs> I'm going to go with uh, one five eight then. Actually, one oh one. It's got to be one that I've actually got written down, right? 
do, do we, does 158 actually, is that a person that was here? 158, it was you, yeah. You had your hand up, yeah. Okay, so 101, please uh, start the pack. Sorry, that was a bit of a mess. <laughs> okay. Please, three questions between you. Uh, my name is Iker, um, I'm from Spain. Um, it's a very specific question that it implies agriculture. Uh, last year, the European Union signed a treaty, uh, a specific agreement with Morocco, in which they buy a huge amount of crops. And a lot of companies in Spain, France, Italy, Portugal lost millions in sales. There were uh, thousands of jobs, of jobs uh, that were lost. And it wasn't because there was a need of supply of crops. So if we are in the European Union and we have uh, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, and we support our farmers and our crops, uh, why we don't uh, say to Morocco to have the same uh, rules, the same labor conditions that our, that our farmers uh, need to comply and also they need to pay? Thanks. One five eight. Yeah. Yep. Hi, my name is Jacobo. I'm also from Spain. So I wanted to ask you, what are your future expectations uh, regarding the high uh, current levels of inflation? And if we are going to keep experience, you think we're going to keep experiencing these high levels of inflation or now with the hawkish monetary policy applied by the European Central Bank, if we're going to experience a soft landing or a hard landing in prices that could potentially take us into a recession? So I would like you to comment on that, and also if you could comment on the uh, Korean uh, euro uh, dropping below parity against the against the US dollar and its implications. Thank you. I'm 101. Hello, I'm Maria from Italy, and I just wanted to refer back to the suggestion made previously of instituting a president of Europe. Um, perhaps one of the greatest critiques made of the European Union is that it suffers a democratic deficit. So I was wondering, firstly, if you agree with that, and secondly, if, there are, if so, if there are any mechanisms that you would suggest implementing in order to tackle that? It's really interesting, that question. I remember when Jean-Claude Juncker was uh, president of the Commission, he came out and did a press conference about a two-hatted president. Never heard anything about it ever since. The member states are really against it. Uh, can you can you start, Lydia, on those? Uh... I will start by these two, two last questions, and then I'll, I'll give uh, the First. question on the, on the <clears throat> the trade uh, deal with uh, Morocco to Michela. Perfect. Um, so inflation, uh, if it's going to last for uh, long or not? Well. Um, we were not expecting a number of events that happened uh, during the, the last uh, few years, um, but it's important to acknowledge that it's not the the rise of inflation or the, the reason why we have inflation is not only provoked by the war in Ukraine. It is a result of uh, 10 years of monetary policy uh, that have um, channeled a lot of money to the economy and that is, you know, contributing to this heating of the economy and accelerated by the war in Ukraine and by the prices in energy. Um, so I think now uh, what uh, economists and, uh, and experts are trying to do is to see in the, you know, in the toolbox that we have in terms of instruments for monetary policy, what can be applied to counter this um, high, very high inflation, which has uh, tremendous costs to households and, and families. Um, I don't have an, a date or a month or any expectation when exactly the inflation is going to uh, come down. But uh, in question is also when we refer to our uh, euro currency, uh, the respect of the mandate of the European Central Bank, which defines as being close to 2% inflation. And now we are clearly very high uh, in those levels. So there's also that um, important legal aspect of the, <clears throat> of the monetary policy. But I think first we need um, peace uh, in Europe again. 
um, and we need to fully understand what are the elements that are provoking this uh, inflation and cope and cope with that. Um, in terms of the the, the exchange US, uh, the US dollar and euro, um, it didn't happen for. I mean, it's the first time it happens, um, and it's also a consequence of the projections or the forecast of recession in Europe. So it is as inflation there and, and there's expectations from the investors. Um, and so it is also affecting the exchange of the uh, between uh, the US and the uh, euro. So I think it's probably um, something uh, that it will be influenced by the raise or by the rise of the interest rates. We will see what the European Central Bank is going to do in the next few months, knowing that the European Central Bank has reacted very late to the to the problematic inflation, inflation because it, they considered that it was a temporary inflation, and there was already some indication that uh, the monetary policy was now having its results more negative. Um, Finally, President of the European Union, I don't have a closed opinion on that. I think it is very good that we go back home and we digest this idea, because you also have to think whether you would feel comfortable or not. Um, I mean, Europe is very diverse. We, are, we have very different cultures, we have uh, different languages, we have different history roots. So um, uh, to what extent we would with all the 27 except uh, a president of the, of the European Union to speak on, on behalf of, of the Union. I think um, the challenges are global. What we have to face, they are global. So the geopolitics um, are very important. And being alone in a globalized world and very interdependent and more and more transnational, I would say it makes sense to explore that, um, that position because it's uh, only when we speak at one voice that we can actually have uh, um, you know, a seat in the front row and not just negotiating some little things that are also important, but uh, when, we, when it is about the global challenges, it's important that we are not uh, left behind. And we see a change in the global order um, we are coming to a more multipolar uh, world where it is uh, absolutely necessary that the European Union um, defines its uh, you know, position in the front line and not in the back bench. So um, with this in mind, I think it is worth exploring to have the, such figure, a person that holds the power um, to represent the European Union um, in all its, uh, its stands. Thank you. C can I say as well, I'm going to go back and watch that. I'm very interested to hear what Manfred Weber, the tone of that. Was he asking us if we should do it or is this his idea? I, I, I'm still not sure on that. And I think that's a, a really interesting suggestion. I, I, I want to work that out. I'm going to rewatch this when, we, when, I, when I get out of here. Michaela, please carry yeah. on. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I will answer a question about uh, the EU-Morocco uh, uh, agreement. Uh, I think your question um, is about competitiveness of our uh, European farmers, especially maybe Spain uh, farmers. Uh, of course, uh, we should look uh, on this. We, we should uh, uh, protect our farmers. And how we can do it? Uh, in, the, in, the treat, uh, in the treaty like this, in the agreement, we should have, we say, uh, so-called um, mirror clauses. So we should ask the same standards of uh, um, the, the products uh, and from the agricultures, from producers, uh, from uh, third countries, like European standards. Uh, for example, for the um, pesticide, for welfare standards. So um, we should have the equal treatment and we should, of course, protect our uh, European uh, uh, agriculture competitiveness. Just uh, one thing, what I would like um, 
um, safe for the, uh, because there were uh, um, asked question about uh, European Year of Youth and uh, accomplishment. I think uh, our uh, Romanian colleague. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, 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 was, so, yeah. so uh, if uh, we are, I don't know, your uh, ask, uh, ask was about uh, the accomplishment of European Year of Youth. Uh, I should say that uh, this, uh, this proposal, this, uh, this European Year of Youth was proposed by Ursula von der Leyen in September 2020, uh, 2021 before Ukraine war, the, the, the purpose was to spotlight on the impact and to raise uh, the situation of youth people um, after COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown. So uh, we, we wanted to, hmm, to, uh, to raise uh, and to attract attention on your problems. And also this event, EPP, uh, youth Week is part of activities of a European Year of Youth. I hope in the end we will have more experience, more information, more um, knowledge about your problems, about your um, demands. Uh, so um, we, are, we, we don't finish today. Uh, um, I hope that in the end of the year, in December, we will have here a big uh, final conference with Commission, Council and Parliament, and uh, we will have uh, the clo uh, some findings what we will publish. I hope we will have, uh, we, we will have many finds to f findings what we can be uh, able to uh, publish and to, to have for the future. So. Okay. Let's leave it there. Thank you so much to Michaela and to Lydia as well. And because I know we've, uh, yeah, we ran over. See you soon. Take it steady. Okay, we're, we're, stay, stay, stay. We've got to do the, the results of the, uh, that's not the end. We've got, we're doing the results of the, uh, the workshops that you've been doing. So Leo is here. Uh, just a quick note. He's going to announce the results of the eight teams that are going to present their ideas here in the parliament tomorrow morning. Um, those people uh, stay uh, and you're going to have a session about how to pitch those ideas. Those that aren't here, you can go to the workshop session, specifically some interesting stuff about building your social media and stuff. Um, I hope you've been tweeting and Instagramming and doing whatever, whatever platform you like to do. Um, and then just a reminder to everyone, the security in the morning specifically to get into the European Parliament can be quite heavy and we've got a lot to go through tomorrow. So make sure you're here as soon as possible. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Leo. I know you've been working hard for the last couple of days outside of this room. Um, so he's going to announce uh, the winners. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. So um, thank you all guys for your hard work. Uh, thank you for your energy and your engagement. Um, now it's time to see which teams are here and who's going to be pitching tomorrow right here from this spot. So the first team is 101, job for you. Round stand applause, up, please. Stand up, guys. Let's stand up and see who that was. 101. <laughs> All right, excellent, thank you. Team number two is 204. Let's grow our packaging. 204, stand up, way. Well done. All right. <laughs> Next up, 205, European Resource Agency. 205. Are they here? Mm, not so much. Oh, yeah, yeah, there they, there they were, there they were. All right, yeah. cool. Uh, 205. Seven, Tim Card. Stand up. Stand up, round of applause, please. Thank you. 306, security program. Stand up, let us see. Yeah, Stand up, guys. <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> Team 406, political Tinder. Political. All right, <laughs> well done. There we go. Team 407, Youth. All right, thank you, guys. And Team 408, Youth Games. No. 
All right, representatives of these eight teams, please stay here. My colleague Kira and I will take you through the preparations for the presentations tomorrow morning. For everybody else, there is still a round of workshops that's waiting for you. It's the same workshops you've missed out on Monday. So the hostesses are waiting outside to take you to the right locations. Thank you, guys, and see you all tomorrow yeah. in the morning. G guys, as well, I've just, I've just been informed, actually, there's a bit of a strike on in Brussels tomorrow. Trains, taxis, and stuff like that, taxis specifically, so definitely make sure you're well in time. We'll try and wrap the session up as soon as possible if there's early flights that need to go. Uh, if you definitely aim to be in this room by 9.30, please, we want to start absolutely on the dot as soon as everyone's here. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Cheers. What? I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, what? all right. Um, team members of the eight teams that are going to present tomorrow, can I ask you to please all come here to the front row?